YouTube and the other platforms as well. So cool. And I think we are live on my YouTube channel as well. So hello everyone. I am here with uh Tachyon Blue, and I don't want to misrepresent how I describe you, but you are a registered Democrat and a liberal. Is that uh accurate? Uh yeah, that's accurate. I'm not sure I'm actually registered <laughs> as a <laughs> as a Democrat, but uh, I am uh on the left. Are you a, are you in your state? Can you vote in the Democrat primary as a unregistered, um, uh, as a non-party registered individual? Yeah, in Missouri you can. Oh, cool. Oh, no. Nice. Oh, are you? Uh, so you're um, you're probably not a big fan of your uh, your senators, are you? Uh, of Howley and uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, not really. I mean, okay, all right. I don't know. I don't really know as much about him as I probably should. But from what I've seen, he's <laughs> I'm not the biggest fan, you know. <laughs> so so tell everyone who you are and where they can find you. Uh, I'm Tachyon Blue on YouTube, Kick, Twitch, and Facebook. I stream occasionally just for fun, do interviews with people, debates, conversations. And uh, I'm on the left. I like to talk about politics, but also uh, gaming sometimes too and other topics. But yeah, I just... Uh, if you enjoy the content of this conversation, check me out. How about you, Andy? Where can people find you? What do you want to do? Uh, I'm on Twitter at Andy underscore P underscore 1989, and I occasionally uh, do YouTube stuff. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to be doing, hopefully every Monday night, a talk with, with someone, probably you quite a bit, because it seems like uh, we have pretty decent discussions. So, um, yeah, YouTuber or Twitter. And I'm a registered Republican. I am a Christian first, Republican second, and I am pretty hated by the left and pretty hated by the right, too. So, so I have very few friends. <laughs> but yeah, let's uh, let's get into it. So you are going to be streaming with a group of your friends after the debates on Wednesday, correct? Uh, yes, at 11 p.m. And you're invited as well if you'd like to, if you uh, can get off work for it. Or <laughs> yeah, if I can, yeah, straight. if I can get off work, I would, I'd love to. Uh, I'd probably, am I, would I be the uh, only Republican uh, or conservative? Uh, no, there? we've got no? Uh, Lauren Delaguna as well. Oh, cool. Oh, you'll have to put me in touch with her at some point too. That would be cool. But yeah, overall, what are your, what are your overall impressions about the upcoming GOP debate and what would you like to see from the candidates? Uh, I'm honestly, I'm not really going in with any expectations. I think it's going to be more or less a shit show. Uh, <laughs> Trump's not going to be there even. So that's going to be a mark against it. But, uh, honestly, I'm what I'm most, mostly going to pay attention to is what they say about Ukraine. And I guess also how they approach the Trump question and whether or not they go all in on the election was stolen stuff or if they want to try and distance themselves from that sort of discussion and rhetoric. Okay. Okay. Awesome. So, yeah, let's uh, let's talk about that for a little bit. So, obviously, and I have this AP News article pulled up, and it just is confirming that Trump is going to skip the – so – he he true he I don't know how you say it. he truthed I guess I his his social media platform's a little bit cringe but he uh basically he tweeted that he wasn't going to be attending debates plural so it sounds like it's not going to just be the debate in Milwaukee on Wednesday it sounds like he's not going to be uh debating at all in any of the debates so what are your what are your impressions as a as a democrat about someone who refuses to participate in debates uh, I don't. I'm generally opposed to it. Yeah, I don't. I think that he probably should want to uh, want to get his voice out there. But also, it's worth pointing out that they wanted him to sign a they wanted him to sign a uh, pledge that he would support whoever the candidate would be. And obviously, as someone who might be eyeing a independent bid, it makes sense that he might want to avoid that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. I think uh, I. Do you think that any so a lot of a lot of personalities on Twitter have been saying that he is potentially skipping the debate for at the behest of his lawyers in regards to the indictments with Georgia, D.C., um, Florida, and I guess the New York indictments wouldn't really have a huge impact on that. But 
do you think um do you think that there's any truth to that or do you think that's just kind of politicizing the indictments a little bit yeah i don't know i mean i'm not going to speculate because i have no information one way or the other i mean it makes mm-hmm. i mean generally speaking it seems like <laughs> lawyers give the advice of don't talk publicly or talk as little as possible publicly but also if you're <laughs> running for office it's probably difficult to do that so <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely and that so that this gets a little bit into into the uh, criminal charges against him and i don't want to go too far down this road but um the the de- the debates and the possible incrimin you know he could say something incriminating during the debates something like that there's been a lot of talk about if uh federal judges and and state judges should put place a i think it's i think the legal term is a stay on the indictments until after the election to hear kind of what the court of public opinion has to say about Donald Trump before, you know, the legal system uh, decides what to do with him. What do you think about holding off on any of the prosecutions until like, let's say November of, uh, you know, or till December of 2024? Uh, I, I would say I'm actually not in favor of that. I, I think that if you're accused of crimes and there's credible reasons to think that they should be prosecuted for it and you're facing prosecution that you being a politician probably shouldn't have any bearing on that okay. that the process should play out as as it would for any other citizen okay and and um you know a lot of a lot of republicans and you know i kind of share the sentiment myself uh they're saying like like for instance in Georgia the the request for the the trial date to be one day before Super Tuesday that seems like it's a little politicized. What would you say to someone like me who would make that objection? Yeah, I haven't seen the the trial date. I didn't know it was uh, set a day before Super Tuesday. I yeah, mean, if I think true. <laughs> it, it might be it might be reasonable for them to request, given that it's it's literally like one day before. It might be mm-hmm. reasonable for them to request like a two day extension on that. Uh, just for campaign reasons, like because he's actively trying to run a campaign on a very important day, not because like it could affect the vote totals. I don't think the that should matter. The idea that it could affect the votes so much. Um, I think that it, it more would matter that it could potentially severely hinder his campaign not to be able to campaign literally the day before the one of the biggest voting days in the country. Right, right, for sure. And... So you were we were talking a little bit about Trump uh Trump skipping the debate and it seems like moderate republicans uh or maybe centrist I don't know how you'd want to describe them they're mostly excited about Mike Pence or Chris Christie uh there's there's going to be so Donald Trump is doing an interview with Tucker on the day of the debate and Chris Christie will be at the debate as far as I know but Chris Christie is going to be doing a interview with, I think, Adam Kinzinger. I think it's tonight. It actually might be going on uh, in an hour or two from now. Are you going to be watching that? No, I actually don't have Fox News. I'm really glad that they're going to be streaming it on Rumble. I Honestly, <laughs> I, I'm kind of pissed at the whole debate thing because I feel like these should be public domain. It's It's a major political event an official political event hosted by political parties and the normal debates are hosted by the commission on presidential debates. This is an official event. It's public information. It should be public domain and available everywhere for free. Yeah, I, I think so. And I, so I'm actually not a huge fan of the debates, the way that they're, they're set up now. It's, it's almost, uh, they're essentially not moderate. They're, they're moderated for, excuse me for views and they're not i i'd almost like to see a more academic style debate with a more i don't know i i, I don't i'm trying to think of, a, of the word to describe it i guess just more academic style debate as opposed to kind of the i think you used the word shit show earlier <laughs> <laughs> does does that make sense no i agree i think that there should be multiple debates probably even more than we have and that they should be they should take the many different forms like you can have like a a short you've got 30 seconds to answer this question and a 15 second rebuttal you could have one like that sure but then also have like like you said like an uh, an academic debate like an oxford style debate where you know they they each give like a 45 minute opening statement and then they have like cross examination and then also have like a debate where it's more like a conversation where they're having to like navigate it themselves with very little moderation about any topics they want to bring up 
Like, I think you should have like multiple different debates and have like multiple styles of it to get like as much information out there as possible. And each and different people are going to respond different ways to the different types of debates. Like some people like, you know, if you're, if you don't follow politics that much, this sort of rapid fire, you get 30 seconds to answer. That might be fine for them. if They don't follow politics very much, but someone who wants to have like a deep dive discussion and really get into the issues, let's have like a 45 minute discussion back and forth on healthcare, for instance, that could be much more useful. Right. Right. Yeah. No, for, for sure. You mentioned issues and I want to get into issues here in a, in a second, but in regards to to a more moderate candidate or a candidate that is perceived as more moderate, someone like Chris Christie or possibly even Mike Pence, is there anything a candidate like Chris Christie or Mike Pence or trying to think of someone who's more on the moderate side, is there anything that they could say to swing a, a liberal like you into voting Republican in uh, in 2024? Well, I probably wouldn't vote in the primary, um, but – no, I don't think so. I think that my overall values are much more aligned with the Democratic Party and that there's very little that the Republicans could do to try and change my mind. Now, the only candidate who I might be interested potentially would be like Nikki Haley. Um, she seems like she's very good on the Ukraine issue from what I've seen, but I don't, you know, she's what polling like, like 4%. So I don't think, uh, yeah, she, I think she's so. Um, I think she's actually pulling ahead of, I, I'd have to check again, but she's pulling ahead of Chris Christie, I believe. And I oh, think, maybe, maybe you know, I'm, not, I think, like, Pence, time, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I can try to pull him up here while we talk, but she might be having a surge moment or something. I don't know. I've not seen, but unfortunately I, I think the Republican party has made this, they made the decision in 2016 to back Trump. And that's had a lot of consequences for the party which you might view as positive in some ways, but also very negative in other ways, the sort of denial of, of the democratic process. And okay. that's, I think, very, very damaging. And unfortunately, a lot of the Republicans on that stage, not all of them, uh, were, were happy to go along with this, or at least not call it out very much. So, so that, gets, that's, that gets into something that I wanted to ask you about, because this is something I hear from um, people on the left a lot. And I, I hear that, in 2016, Republicans went so far radically to the right. And I can, I can see some of the arguments for that. But from a policy position, policy-wise, I don't see how the Republican Party has moved all that far to the right. So in your opinion, as a, as a Democrat or as someone that leans to, to the Democrat Party, what policy positions do you think that the, the Republican Party has moved further to the right on since, let's say, the year 2000? Well, it's difficult to say because I don't think that Trump necessarily represents the traditional right. Like you are correct in that assessment that he doesn't. What he seems to represent is this sort of very populist, anti-immigration, anti-elite, and unfortunately, anti-democratic backlash and that's sort of where they've moved i think to the right but they've also it's it's they've if i say moved to the right i mean like moved more towards fascism <laughs> than i do moved more towards like the republican party of reagan they you know they i mean trump was out there hugging you know the gay pride flag at the rnc right <laughs> or maybe didn't hug it but he was uh supporting uh gay marriage you know, he obviously doesn't really give a, give a shit about abortion, it seems, on a personal level. It's not like a, a motivating issue for him. And he he did pass tax cuts, which is a sort of de facto, like sort of basic conservative policy that they've been pushing for decades. But where he's really broken from from the right and moved in a different direction, I think, is this more pro-fascist direction. This idea that elections only count if we win and the media is the enemy of the people, and all this sort of rhetoric and actions taken to undermine the democratic process. So, so let's. And I don't. I don't want to. I don't. I don't want to turn it into a debate. I'm. I'm trying to just ask questions. So don't. Don't take this as me trying to debate you. Now, back in 2016. Now, to to respond to that, a Republican would ask you, like, so back in 2016. The DNC had a website set up asking electors to um, change from 
you know, voting for Trump to voting for Hillary in the electoral college. And they needed, I think it was, I think the website was something 37 because they needed 37 Republican electors to, to switch over. So, so Republicans would say, well, the Democrats did the same th- thing in 2016, asking the electoral college to overturn the, the election. So it seems like it's going on on both sides. So what would you say to, to someone who would, would, you know, object in that manner? Well, I, I know you don't want to get too much into a debate, but no, it's it's wholly non-comparable. We have an electoral college because we want to stop authoritarian individuals and individuals with authoritarian tendencies or who are wholly unfit for office from becoming president. I mean, I think the electoral college was basically created to stop somebody like Trump, right? It's part of the normal electoral system in the United States. You might not like it. You might want to get, a, get rid of the electoral college, and I'm open to arguments on that account, but like the the, the system that that was created exists to prevent certain demagogic figures from rising to power. And but so, that's sort so of what the, that's what the process is for. Right. I, and I, I understand what you're saying. And, and I think I agree with it to an extent, but like in 2016, right after the election, Trump hadn't done and he hadn't been in office yet. And so to ask them to overturn, um, his his nominee or him winning the election uh, from the electoral college standpoint based on something he hadn't done yet that seems or hadn't even been accused of doing yet that seems to me to be a little hypocritical and I, I, I again we don't have to debate this but um, you know in the eyes of a lot of people what the Democrats did asking the electoral college to change their votes in in 2016 is the same thing that Trump was asking in in 2020. Well, there's also the distinction of the fact that the sitting president of the United States was not involved in, in this process. Barack Obama was not encouraging people to switch their votes in the Electoral College. But I think it would be fine if he did, because that Electoral College is the democratic process, right? We're As Republicans and conservatives like to, like to say, right, we're not a democracy, we're a republic. This is a specific check that we've created in our institutions to provide a check on popular on, on basically uh, the uh, fuck, what's the <laughs> dictatorship of the masses, basically, right? The, right. Uh, the madness of crowds. We, that's why I've created the electoral process, uh, the electoral college, in part also to balance out the states to some extent, too, so that some states don't have overwhelming power over other states. But no, that that is the election, right? You don't vote for president of the United States. You vote for who you want to be president of the United States. And then a slate of electors is selected and sent to the electoral college. And I think it's perfectly fine for electoral college people to, to vote their conscience insofar as we have this system, it should probably work without any sort of, without any sort of limitation on who they can vote for. And I think trying to convince them to change their minds, I think that's perfectly reasonable. So you're you're not using violence or threats or things like that, you know? So you would, you would be opposed to, so like, for instance, there's talk about, um, well, I think I think in Michigan they did indict the electors that voted against uh, um, against Biden in 2020, and they're talking about indicting the electoral college in Arizona for doing the same thing. So you would be against those those indictments then? Are you talking about the fake electors that Trump tried to do, or like actual electors that were sent to Congress? Well, there were actual the, the electors election. that that were. I mean, I guess you could call them fake. But they were actual delegates to the Electoral College. You're talking about actual delegates who were, mm-hmm. quote unquote, faithless electors. Yes. OK. Uh, no, I mean, I, I so our federal system, I, I don't I'm generally against the idea that we should prosecute faithless electors. I'm actually generally opposed to the Electoral College in general. But insofar as it exists, um, it's perfectly fair to play within that system. OK. But as it, when it comes to the faithless electors, um. I know states are given broad deference in how they can assign their electors and also broad deference in how in uh, in how they treat them, too. So I, states, I think, can they do have the legal authority to prosecute them if they don't do what the state wants or if they if they don't, which means basically de facto that they voted for a candidate other than the one who won the popular vote. I think they I think they had the legal right to do that. States do whether they should exercise that legal right. Is a different question. I'd say probably not. Okay. All right. 
And let's see. I wanted to ask you. So I wanted to ask you about the the possibility of someone primarying Joe Biden. So there was a lot of talk from, I think, in agreement on political pundits from both left-wing sources and right-wing sources that Ron DeSantis kind of had to make a move this year because his term in Florida expires in 2027 and and two years of not being in office is a long time leading up to a potential presidential bid in, in 2028. And someone like Gavin Newsom is in the exact same situation. And it seems like Gavin Newsom is somewhat campaigning uh, to a certain extent for for a position as pres- president. Do you think that someone like him will try to primary uh, Joe Biden in going into 2024? Uh, probably not. I mean, who knows, right? Obviously, he has the right to run if he wants to. But uh, I think he's going to look at Joe Biden's numbers on this and and decide not to run. He's going to wait. Okay. And um, what do you do? You think um, do you think like someone like him could beat Donald Trump, or do you think that Joe Biden is the best person uh, for the job? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know enough about Newsom in particular. I mean, it's possible that some Democrats could have a better chance of beating Trump than Biden. Like I, maybe Jared Polis in Colorado, um, more of like a libertarian style Democrat. Mm-hmm. But uh, I don't know about Gavin Newsom in particular enough to oh. say. I mean, obviously he has that the French Laundry scandal, uh, which is I think is a pretty big fucking deal actually. That he, yeah, and many many politicians actually had uh, they were you know implementing these rules on one hand and then not following them themselves. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean. Gretchen Whitmer in Michigan did the same thing. She was like, she was having local sheriffs arrest people. Meanwhile, her husband was like in Charlevoix, Michigan on his boat. The only, the only one able to boat that weekend. So they weren't allowing people to boat at all. (laughs) Yeah, no, they were, they were like, uh, that same weekend, there were like people being arrested, like going to the Marina, I guess, or something like that. And like her, her husband was out on uh, Lake Char, uh, uh, I guess it's Lake Michigan. Um, but Charlevoix is like in between like uh, Traverse City and Petoskey up in the uh, up in northern Michigan, north the northern lower peninsula. But um, I'll tell you. So this is this is my fear. My fear is that Michelle Obama decides to run because I think Michelle Obama would defeat any Republican candidate probably close to double digits. I think she would probably get sixty percent of the popular vote. Which is uh, which is my fear. I'm really, I'm really hoping she doesn't decide to run. I think Gavin Newsom would probably, uh, I think he probably would not do as well as Joe Biden. But I think Michelle Obama would, if if Gavin Newsom was Michelle Obama's running mate, I think that she that ticket would probably win sixty percent of the popular vote. I would guess. What do you think yeah, about maybe. my assessment there? Yeah, maybe. I mean, we're such we're such a polarized country. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure anybody can get 60% these days. Yeah, I mean, I, I so I have access to like some numbers, uh, like in the state of Arizona, just being a part of a pre, like both Republican precincts and Democrat precincts can get voter registration numbers, and I'm in a I'm in a very uh, I'm in a very liberal area, and even in the very liberal area, only th- I think only like 37% of registered voters are Democrats. I think 30% are Republicans and the, the rest are uh, independents. So there's a large number of independents. And in saying that someone's independent this day and age is probably not really, I mean, most people probably have picked a side, I would say. Do you think that's fair? Yeah. I mean, what does independent mean though, right? Because like, there are plenty of people who call themselves independent, but they vote reliably for for one party or the other yeah yep yeah for sure i don't know how many like true i don't know how many true centrists there are anymore i don't know what do you think about that uh i don't think someone has to be a centrist i don't think there's anything wrong with being ideological oh no yeah no i totally agree i'm 
I'm probably the most ideological person out there, and I have no, I have no problem with that. But yeah, it's I so funny too because oh god, sorry. Oh no, no, say what you're gonna say. It's it's because I think people always talk about. They always talk about oh, it's important to be moderate. I want someone who's like in the middle. Well, one, I don't think they understand what that means because people like actual quote unquote like moderates, self-described moderates, have like all sorts of weird views. Right? They've got. They're, you know, they might be like really conservative on some issues, like super liberal on other issues. Like they're not like dead in the middle, like people think they are. And then at the same time, I think that moderate is often like more of an affect than anything else. I'm, I'm perfectly fine with people having a moderate affect, and like I'm pretty extreme in, in like some of my views. But we're able to have this conversation. I'm not insulting you. I'm not calling you an evil Nazi, you know, or whatever. You know, I'm able to have the conversation, and you are as well. And that's that's sort of a different kind of moderation that I think is is what we should probably be mo- more moving towards, the ability to have conversations with a wide array of people who disagree with us, right? Rather than this, oh, I'm moderate on X, Y, or Z policy, and the truth is right in the middle, and I, I, that's the kind of moderation I'm not really in, in favor of. I think that people people value too highly. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think that I think that it's important for people to be able to have discussions and to not. Uh, you know, become the reply guy on Twitter, which I mean, I think everyone's a little bit guilty of of that. But I think uh, I think that we've become very polarized in this country, and I think that that's I think that's understandable. And I I think I think that like I would be I'm a, I'm opposed to I'm opposed to to sacrificing my ideology for the sake of unity. And I, I, I wouldn't ask that you do the same. Like I wouldn't ask that you sacrifice your views for the sake of unity either. I think that, I think that having um, some sort of polarization is probably a good thing because it means people are sticking to their, to their guns, but we have become so polarized that we can't even have a discussion anymore about anything. And that's, unhealthy i think but i i think that i think that to a certain extent um people being unwilling to waver in their their views is a little bit healthier than maybe where we were at as a nation 30 years ago because it kind of led to this conglomeration of giant government and i i think like i think even democrats have a problem with with the bureaucracy and government right like i i think you know I think that's probably most evident in the the court system, like having judges appointed by conservative uh, presidents and conservative governors is probably just as aggravating to Democrats as it is to Republicans to have liberal presidents doing the same thing. Right. And that's kind of a bureaucratic position that is, you know, appointment for life. Right. In most cases. So I think that we could probably find common ground on that aspect, maybe. Probably and like reforming how exactly we choose our Supreme Court justices. I, I, I and not, maybe not even just the Supreme Court, but even lower courts as well. But yeah, I mean, I'm very open to like reforming that, not in terms of like packing the court, but creating some sort of like system that most people could more or less live with. That and there's there's many different ideas here. Like there's having like a a nonpartisan like commission of people that's chosen by a lot. And you, this is sort of more my idea. You have a sort of like a, a citizen's assembly chosen by lot, chosen by random, at random, essentially. And that this group of people will uh, will be dro- driven from multiple sectors of life. So most, like say, like half of them will be driven by, will be co- will come from people who passed the bar in, in, in the States. So mm-hmm. people chosen at random from those, from that group of people. Then you'd have like maybe some of them chosen from like civil liberties groups and from a nonpartisan civil liberties groups. Some of them drawn maybe from the population at large, and uh, this this commission would then meet and then discuss appointees and make recommendations and and basically then submit a slate of judges to the Senate to be approved. Oh, as opposed to having uh, the 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 executive branch nominate judges. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? So this yeah, this citizens assembly would then nominate the judges. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That makes that I, I probably, pro- I'd have to think about it, but I could probably get behind that. 
and you can have like a check too. So it's you can have like a check where like the the legislative body, such as the Senate, would have uh, some sort of veto power mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, or you could you could have your your citizens assembly, you know, pick a pick twenty justices, and then the president could select one to nominate from that pool of twenty, and then the Senate has veto power or whatever. So it's it's yeah. Oh, I no, think definitely. I lost it. Oh, you're there. Never Sorry. Mind. Yeah, I um, I think I'm having some trouble broadcasting on YouTube for some reason. I'm not sure it's coming oh. through. I can give you uh, the, I, I'm recording, so I can. I'm give recording, you recording too. So oh, perfect. Upload it after. Well, that's good. I'm but yeah, and the I, problem where oh, go ahead. <laughs> oh, I was just gonna say I'm I'm not opposed to. So I I think that I'm opposed to like adding you know 30 justices to the supreme court like I, I like i like having like nine justices that's you know or or we could say seven justices like somewhere less than less than uh an odd number less than 11 i'll say but i'm not opposed i so i understand the argument that you appoint a supreme court justice for life because then it, it they don't have to worry about campaigning and making promises stuff like that so it's it's a check on keeping them to be unbiased, but I don't think that that's effective. So, and I don't want, you know, a Supreme court justice in their eighties or nineties, you know, making legal decisions. Like I, I think at that point, like you should, you know, enjoy your time playing shuffleboard in Florida or something. <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm not opposed to having uh, some sort of a term limit on Supreme court justices either. You know, I think that that's probably, I think, uh, I think maybe, maybe, maybe that's another area where Democrats and Republicans can come together, like having people in their seven late seventies, eighties and nineties running our government probably isn't the best idea. Like, did you, did you see the Mitch McConnell video? Yeah. Where he froze up. Yeah. Oh I mean, it, I, I'm theoretically open to there being some sort of like maximum age, but man, it's, it's tough when you, it's tough to support any sort of thing. Any sort of policy that's going to put some, especially for like the democratic process for like running for office, it's going to be very tough to support any sort of policy that's going to place restrictions on that other than the voters. Like, for instance, Trump can run from prison, right? <laughs> People have done it before. You could run for office from prison. Yeah. But, and it's weird that we would say like, oh, you can do that, but you can't, you can't do it if you're, you know, over the age of 75 or something. You know, I so so I I'm actually I'm actually okay with saying that like a criminal if someone's a convicted criminal that they can't run for office. Like so and I think we talked last last time we talked, I think I explained to you how I think that um that like our government is responsible to God and that we have to um and that we have to submit to God both as a church and as a government and part of part of my theology is that leaders have to meet certain criteria that they're held to a different standard and i won't i won't go super into the theology of it but it's it's from first timothy chapter three and titus chapter one if you're ever interested and i don't think that someone who is a convicted criminal meets that qualification that's listed out there to be uh, a leader and so if someone was, if, you know, if, if President Trump was convicted by a jury of his peers, uh, I don't think he would be qualified to be president of the United States because I don't think that that, um, that meets the biblical qualification of the, the theological term is overseer in that case. Well, good but, thing we don't live in a theocracy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say oh, theonomy. Oh, no. But, <laughs> but yeah, so, so my bottom, my, my point being is like, I, I could get behind the idea that if, if someone's a convicted criminal, they shouldn't be running for office. I think that should be disqualifying. Well, then you're going to live in a very dangerous world though, where you, where people are going to be sent to prison. So that, so that by their political adversaries, so that they uh, can't run for office. Yeah, no, ab absolutely. That's why, that's why I like, so like I'm, so I'm I'm pro death penalty but I'm not pro death penalty right now. So I 
I add, I would add, if we lived in a society that was, uh, that had a better justice system, that had a, what I would, you know, I would describe as a biblical justice system, I would be for the death penalty because I think that it would cut down on the possibility of, um, executing people that are innocent, right? I don't trust our justice system right now, uh, to, to be able to fairly and, uh, judiciously execute people deserving of the death penalty. So I'm opposed to the death penalty in our society, but I would be, um, I would be supportive of the death penalty in a just society. And it's the same way. I wouldn't trust our society right now to, um, to be able to fairly criminally convict someone and exclude them from running for office. So in, in my perfect world, yes, but I guess is what I'm getting at. But right now, probably not. Did that make so sense or was that that was a little long? You're pro life, but you support the death penalty? Uh, I'm not pro life. I'm an abolitionist. So I am I am against terminating innocent life. I am all for uh the death penalty for individuals that have committed certain crimes. Yeah, I'm I'm against the death penalty altogether. I mean, I, I not necessarily on the moral ground that I don't think anybody should ever die under any circumstances. Mm-hmm. But I don't think the state should have the power the power to kill people, or that it shouldn't have the right to kill people who have already basically been surrendered and are in their custody. Okay. Yeah, I mean, like like right in in our society today, I would I would agree with that. But if we lived in a society that I think is is you know, perfectly just and, and that the justice system makes, you know, very, 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 very few mistakes and that it's, it's, you know, nearly a perfect justice system. I would say that, uh, for murder and rape, I would advocate the death penalty, but, um, that would be, I'm trying to think if there's, there's probably a couple other, um, situations involving murder or rape, I guess that I would advocate for the death penalty, but, um, well, why do you? Why do you? Why would you want necessarily for the state to kill these people rather than detain them? Especially since you can never have a system that's one hundred percent perfect, too. Um, why would I want the state to do that? Because that's what the Bible says. The Bible advocates for the state to um, punish murder with the death penalty. Yeah, I mean, just you're not going to convince me, unfortunately, with the biblical arguments. So, but that's fine. <laughs> no, no I, I'm not expecting to, <laughs> but that's that's why I believe it. I and oh, I'm, I'm, I, you know, I'm not. I don't try to convince people. I just, you know, I just try to answer as best as I can. But yeah, most of most of my beliefs are, um, you know, I could use the answer because the Bible says so. <laughs> but well, how uh, are you going to convince? all these people who disagree with you though. I mean, if you are operating within a democratic society, you probably have to like make secular arguments that people who don't believe in your faith or in your interpretation of your faith are going to disagree with. How do you get them on your side? I'm not going to. So how are you going to win and get your policies? So this, this gets into kind of a, a feel. I don't know how far down this road that you want to go, but we can go down there. Um, So, I don't believe that I can actually change anyone's mind, heart, belief system whatsoever. Um, I believe that only God can change someone's heart. So I am not going to, I could give you the best argument for, let's say we were discussing abortion, I guess, or something. I could give you the most coherent argument ever. Uh, and be the best debater on the planet and, you know, have the IQ of Albert Einstein and just totally provide the best argument. It's not going to convince a single person. The only way that person is going to be convinced is if God, if God reaches out and changes their heart. So that's, that's, um, there's a theological concept called irresistible grace. And that's kind of what I'm describing here. Um, but yeah, my my policy positions are not going to be accepted by people who are not Christians, and it's they're never going to be accepted by people who are not Christians unless unless and until God changes their hearts. 
I mean, I don't know. I mean, I've changed my mind on all sorts of issues. You've, you even said before the stream that you're, you want to talk about that, how you are possibly rethinking a certain issue yourself. Yeah, no, no. I, I, and I'm, I'm not saying that people do not change their minds and that there's not certain elements of God, you know, changing people's hearts a little bit at a time, stuff like that. Um, but for instance, I am not going to get you to change your whole ideological position by any argument that I can make. It would have to be, in my opinion, it's, it's God changing your heart that, um, would change your positions. Um, and that gets a little bit into what's called like Calvinist theology. I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, reformed theology at all or Calvinist no. theology. No, that's, that's, uh, that's like, that's like a uh, 50 hour discussion that we could have there. So I don't know. I don't, I don't want to go too far down that, that rabbit hole, but, um, but essentially I think, I think a good way to, I'm trying to think of the best way to say it. I think that for the most part, people are not going to change their minds. I think that it requires divine intervention for someone's heart to change for their mind to change. But, um, but you did mention that I may have rethinked my position on Ukraine a little bit. Do you want to uh, take a look at this article with me and I can get your reaction? Oh man, I'm in the middle of this, <laughs> this super laggy game. So. Oh, okay. Well here, I'll, uh, I'll pull it up and I'll you can summarize um, it for me. I'll summarize it for you. Let me, let me pull it up. Um, and that way I can give you the, the TLDR. I want to make sure that I have the right article pulled up here. I don't know that it changes my, um, my position on U S intervention at all in Ukraine. Like I, I still think, I don't think that the United States, uh, all right, I'm out. I'm should intervene. Guy. Oh, you didn't have to leave your game on my, no, no, it's, I won, but, but <laughs> the guy left. Mm. Starcraft, but uh, sorry, you were. Oh no, that. totally fine. Um, I have the article pulled up. If you want to take a look, let me make sure this is the right article. Yeah, if you want to link it to me too, I can pull it up. Yeah, article. let me. Uh, I just sent it to you in uh, Discord. I apologize to my chat for this god awful quality. The YouTube stream in particular, it's it's not coming through right. It's like super laggy. It's it's literally right now. It's talking about when you were asking about Gavin Gavin Newsom. That's how far back behind it is. It's been buffering. Oh wow! Jeez. Yeah, it's like it's like super super far back. I don't know why. Goodness uh, gracious! Bit rates wrong or something. But oh, anyway, gosh, does it have to do with multi streaming? You think, or is it just? You it think? might be. Yeah, it might be. So it's kind of a long article, and I'm gonna try to find. The part that I might let me see if I can find it here. I, I read the article a couple days ago, so just bear with me. So this is. Are you familiar with uh, Doug Wilson at all? Uh no, no. So he probably so he's a he's a Christian pastor in Moscow, Idaho, and he he's probably most famous for he did a ser he wrote a book uh, with Christopher Hitchens. And did a series of debates with Christopher Hitchens about the book, um, probably, gosh, almost 15 years ago now, I would, I would imagine. Uh, so that's who, that's who wrote this article. And he's, he's a pretty prolific writer. Um, and he talks in here a, a lot about, um, Ukraine being justified in their defense. And, and so I, I, I think that that's where, I've probably shifted a little bit more like I'm, I'm, you know, I think we were talking about how, how previously I said Ukraine, if it's to save lives, to save their people's, their own lives, they should um, consider surrender. If it preserves more lives than they would lose. Do you remember me saying better that? to better to live a slave than die a free man, basically? Yeah. I don't want to phrase it exactly like that, but, but sure we can, yeah, we can say that. Um, and so he writes here 
And all the while, we should be praying that Putin the dastard will have seriously overestimated his ability to get what he wanted quickly, and that his regime back home gets the staggers as a result of this black pro, uh, frolic. Pray that the Ukrainians defend their country stoutly, as they have certainly been doing so far, and that Putin fail in this jaunt utterly, completely, finally, and totally. So I, I think that that's, I think that describes how I feel about the conflict pretty well. I think that, that I probably wasn't strong enough in my uh, hope and desire that Putin gets destroyed completely. And so I think I've shifted a little bit more um, pro Ukrainian in that aspect. Um, and I'm still, I still think that there's a ton of corruption in the Ukrainian government. I still think that, Zelensky is a grifter. Um, but I think that I'm, I'm more in favor of Ukraine doing everything that they can to defend their nation. Um, even, even at the loss of their own life, if that's, if that's what they, they choose to do. I'm not, I, I'm against mandatory conscription in the United States as well. I think if someone wants to conscientiously object to, to fighting, like, I, I think that people that wanted to not fight in Vietnam, I think they were perfectly justified in saying, no, I don't want to be part of the draft. Um, so I think the same concept applies in Ukraine. If the Ukrainian people don't want to defend, if they want to um, avoid fighting in a war, I think that they have every right to, to do that. But I think that I'm a little bit more uh, pro defending their nation. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, so, Wow. Do you really want to get into this deep now, or do you want to save that for a different discussion? I, I, know um, if I, I know if I ask some certain questions, we're going to get into like a huge rabbit hole. So, you go go ahead and ask your questions. If we're going too far down the rabbit hole, we can we can stop. But let's talk about it a little bit. If it's morally just for Ukraine to defend itself, why isn't it morally just for others to assist it? Um. So let me read you the last paragraph here. So it says, even if Biden were morally qualified to lead a military response to the Ukrainian situation, he isn't, but work with me. He does have the, he does not have the competence. Anything he does on the world stage is likely to resemble the debacle of our withdrawal from Afghanistan. So before Biden goes off to rescue any Ukrainians, perhaps we should ask him to get the stranded Americans remaining in Afghanistan out first. American corruptions and mendacity were a major contributor to this war. Putin remains responsible for the aggression itself, but we have a major, but we have been a major player in establishing the conditions under which a character like Putin could operate. So I, I think that I'm against American involvement is because we're essentially a corrupt player in this whole situation ourselves, and we don't have the moral authority to police the world. I mean, what, what does that mean that we're that we're in that we're a corrupt player in the situation itself. I mean, the United States of America, I think, is uh, generally been a pretty force for good. I mean, our position is very clear on Ukraine and very clear when it comes to national sovereignty and Europe. That is, if you're an independent country, you're allowed to set your own foreign policy. If you want to join the European Union, you can. If you want to join NATO, you can apply for that as well. You other countries shouldn't be able to di dictate what you do. They shouldn't be able to stage coups in your country and, and run puppet regimes. They should, you should be able to rule yourself and have a degree of sovereignty and Russia violated that sovereignty. Well, well, so here's, here's an, here's a good example of Western corruption. in this is, is NATO. Like we've steadily been trying to push NATO East ever since the fall of the Soviet union. Right. By pushing and, NATO East, you mean that like sovereign countries are scared that Russia is going to invade them. So they join NATO and Russia says, well, gosh, why would you be afraid of us invading you? And then they they do just that. Yeah, well, I mean, it's 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 escalatory, right? We know that we know that strategic neutrality in those nations provided a buffer zone between Russia, Russian aggression and um, and the West. And so if we hadn't been if we hadn't been advocating for I, I think the big mistake was taking nukes away from Ukraine back in the 90s. I think that. Russia probably would not have um, invaded Ukraine if they if they feared Ukrainian nuclear retaliation, right? But as a foreign policy position, we use those those countries in between the NATO countries and Russia as a buffer zone. Um, you know, 
kind of like another Berlin Wall, I guess. Uh, and and you know both you know our policy was okay. We're not going to go into those countries and get them to be NATO countries as long as you don't um, invade. And then we've kind of been advocating for all those countries to join NATO ever since. And I think I mean that, they want to, right? <laughs> no, I know, but just because they want to doesn't mean we should let them, right? I mean, why shouldn't we, right? Why shouldn't we have a, a global alliance of of democratic free societies that will mutually defend each other in case of attack. That sounds because great. In fact, the only time NATO has ever been activated has been in the United States' interests after 9-11. Well, you, you, you said, why shouldn't we do that? Well, I think we shouldn't do that because it ends up with situations like Ukraine today. Do you think there would be, do you think that Russia would be a lot more aggressive if there wasn't a NATO? I, so I think, I think Russia, no, I, I think having NATO is, is, in, in this situation, I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to say having NATO is fine, because I think NATO has a lot of, have has done a lot of corrupt things in the past. But I think that in this situation, it would be fine to have you know NATO. But we should say that we're not going to invite you know, you could say Ukraine, Belarus, um, the Czech uh, Czech Republic, those countries. You know, the bo- countries that border Russia into nato so that we create a you know i don't know if you watch star trek but like a romulan neutral zone uh in between the two empires yeah i mean i think that that ukraine and latvia lithuania poland that these are sovereign countries they should be able to conduct their own policy if they want to join the european union they should have the right to do that they want to join nato and have a collective defense treaty they should they have the right to do that too. And why would, if Russia is, if Russia is afraid of a mutual defense alliance on its border, then uh, that's on them because they've created the conditions where these countries have every reason to believe that Russia will invade them because Russia has invaded them. Okay. So let's say, let's use an extreme hypothetical here. Okay. Let's say, let's say, um, Let's say United States, Canada, and Mexico are um, are all in three separate. They have no alliances, no relationships whatsoever to, to each other. And the United States and Canada say, you know what, we're going to form an alliance. And in doing so, they know that Mexico is going to attack. Would you advocate that alliance, um, knowing that uh, Mexico is going to attack the United States? Uh, potentially. If Mexico is going to attack the United States, we want our allies. But also, you don't have to use a hypothetical. The United States and Canada are allies. <laughs> They're both <Yeah>. NATO members. <laughs> no, no I, I understand that. But I, what I'm saying is is if, if, you, if creating an alliance is going to cause a conflict, if our, if, our, if our goal is to avoid military conflict in the world, which maybe that's not our goal, but if, if we know that creating an alliance is going to cause conflict and cause loss of life, do you not think that we should reconsider that alliance? Uh, potentially in a theoretical setting, but, but there's no reason to think that, that Russia is going to invade other countries, right? There's no, there's no reason to think that, oh, well, if we just don't join, if, if we don't let Poland in, if we kick out the Poles, Russia is going to be a peaceful power on the world stage. They're going to ab- 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 abandon their imperial ambitions, right? There's no reason to think that that's going to be the case. I, I think that that's where I think that's where I would disagree. I think that there's I think that there's reason to believe that if we don't escalate things, then Russia will stand down. I don't think. Oh um, no. I I don't think I think that when you, uh, what is it? What's the the saying? When you poke the bear, you know, if the bear's sleeping, you don't want to poke the bear, right? I think that there's some wisdom to that. I mean, we're poking the bear by letting what? Letting Ukraine? They weren't even they weren't even <laughs> applying to join NATO prior to getting invaded, right? They were just wanting to join the European Union. They were wanting to join. They were wanting to join a free trade alliance, right? Right. Russia invaded them. Well, that, from, that from I mean, joining that, a free trade group. I mean, that's what we're talking about, right? Yeah. No. Yeah. I I agree. It was it was a it was a, a wrong invasion, but um, but that 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 strategic neutrality was lost when 
um, we were advocating for Ukraine to join the European Union. That put Russia to anything that that. So, for instance, right now, as we think about dealing with China and Taiwan, and I think Taiwan has more strategic advantage probably to the United States than than Ukraine does. I don't I don't really know what Ukraine offers the United States. They're they're not really producing anything that we import, right? They they don't have a lot to offer us. Uh, whereas, I mean, they're they're a pretty major economic power in the region. They produce a lot of wheat, but yeah. not not that's imported into the United States. Yeah, they're also they're also a very uh, very valuable strategic location as well. Yeah, they they are a strategic location. That's true. Um, and I think it's good that the democratic free societies of the world unite and eventually move towards a society where there is a global era of peace and prosperity, which I mean, we're basically kind of already living in, right? We're living unless, in this, this unless you massive... live in Southeast Asia, Africa or Eastern Europe. No, I mean, no, even, or, even, or even South in America countries, wars between countries is rare. Like the right, like invasions, like the Russian invasion of Ukraine, like that's a pretty rare phenomenon. Like there's internal disputes usually, but wars between countries is pretty rare. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll give you that. But but my my point was being is that Taiwan has more strategic importance than Ukraine, right? I I'd probably agree so, but I also think that the Ukraine conflict is related to Taiwan. I think yeah, that no, if we want to deter, yeah, we we talked about this. Yeah, we we talked about. I and I I agree that that they're they're connected. Um, but you know, for for instance, if if um like so, the United States we're we're allowing the Taiwanese semiconductor company to to build plants here in the United States, correct? Uh, I believe so. Yeah. And it wasn't until we started allowing the, that company to build plants. They're, they're building one near me actually. Um, that China started to escalate its, its military operations um, in the vicinity of Taiwan. Right. So that, that decision, which is a strategic decision, we we're allowing semi, we're trying to, um, build more semiconductors here in the United States in case China, um, you know, invades Taiwan. Uh, but that decision, it increased military, you know, it escalated the military situation between China and, and Taiwan, right? Uh, no, I don't. I mean, look, I think the fact is that China has wanted to take over Taiwan for a very long time, and it's probably a major policy goal of Xi Jinping. I yeah, think no, no, very much, very much wanting to quote unquote unify China, and this is going to happen regardless of whether or not we we build semiconductor plants in the United States. But also, I I don't think that China should be able to hold the United States hostage and be like, no, look, you can't build these plants, you can't make these contracts with Taiwanese companies, or you can't. No, build your that's, own. that's not that's not what I was arguing. But what I was what I'm trying to get at is that. When we do some, when we make a decision, whatever that decision is, whether it's an alliance or allowing something to to be built here in the United States or anything like that, it does have foreign policy repercussions. And doing something that escalates tensions between China and Russia is probably not a good thing because we want to try to avoid conflict as much as possible. I'm not, you know, my position is that we should try to avoid conflict, not seek conflict out. And I think that, for instance, by allowing Ukraine to try to join the EU. I think that that, um, I think that that escalated tensions and was the, the impetus for Russia to invade Ukraine. And I think that's, I think that's why, uh, what was it a month or two ago? I think that's why they didn't allow uh, Ukraine to join NATO at that moment. Right. Well, they didn't allow them to join NATO because of the, uh, the Crimea dispute, right? Cause Russia had already taken over Crimea. In order to join NATO, you can't have any active territorial disputes, right? Well, I think I think if they really wanted to, they would have let them join, right? Oh, they could change the change the rules, sure. Yeah, I think if they really want, I I I, I think that um, I think that the, I mean, maybe you'll completely disagree, but I think maybe we could agree that there was strategic advantage in not allowing uh, Ukraine into NATO at the, this moment. Well, we should let them in now because they're engaged in an active war. So, <laughs> like, I don't know how Article Five is going to work if you let them in in the middle of a war. 
<laughs> but after the war, sure, I'm, I'm fine with them joining. Okay. Uh, that, 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 that war could take many times, right? It could be that Ukraine takes back all of their territory. It could be that, that there's some sort of deal where maybe they give uh, Crimea to Russia in exchange for, for peace. Or it could be that there's some sort of demilitarized zone, like a UN zone or something in between Russia and Ukraine. Like they, they could take many forms, but after the war, I'd be, I'd be fine with them as long as they remain a, a free and democratic society joining. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I just, I, I don't think, I think just to circle back to the, to the beginning of this, I just, I don't think that, I think, I, I think that I'm kind of in the position of, of people that were against Iraq in the early two thousands. I just, I don't want to see the United States being a major player on the world stage. I just don't think it's good for the American people. I think it's expensive for us. I think that, um, I don't think like we're, I don't think we're a perfect nation. I don't, I think that we're actually, we have a lot of corrupt politicians and we have a lot of corrupt big businesses that, that are, you know, I'm trying to, I don't want to say like raping the Ukrainian people of, of their livelihood or raping the United States taxpayer, but that's kind of the sense, like they're, they're abusing people for their own, um, goals. And I don't think, I don't think we can, I, I would imagine that we agree that like these giant corporations in the, in the United States are not altruistic. And I think that they're the real winners in conflicts like this, the Raytheons, the Halliburtons, the BAE systems, the Northrop Grumman's, you know, Raytheon. Yeah. I'm I, fine I with, that, I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm going to shock you with this, but I'm pretty, I'm pretty pro capitalism and look, uh, Weapons manufacturers, I want there to be more of them, right? I want to have a, a large array of weapons manufacturers and defense contractors that the United States can operate with mm-hmm. so that we can get more ideas, more innovation, and better prices due to competition. Okay. All right. I'd be fine. Yeah, you know, I, maybe we need to break up some of the currently existing ones. We might agree on something like that. But uh, Yeah, I, th- I, think, yeah. I think there's a whole lot of cro- like crony capitalism. Um, I think there's a lot of... Uh, we probably need to relook at our antitrust laws um, and break up some uh, companies into some smaller entities, but, and it doesn't help that, you know, Vanguard, BlackRock, you know, these companies own 80% of the shares of, uh, you know, most companies around the world. That's probably not a good I mean, is thing. Is that to true? Have. Do they own 80%? Uh, well, I mean, I, give me give me a company. Just pick a company off the uh, top of your head. I don't know Tesla. Tesla. But these are also uh, these are firms that invest on behalf of other people, right? Like Vanguard is. Right, but you know, they're people's four hundred one ks and stuff. So yeah, but the the problem. So the problem is what. So like, if um, if Vanguard. Let's say Vanguard owns, you know, the major is the majority shareholder in a company. Um, yeah, it's a group of people that own mutual funds in Vanguard that are owning the company, but the the voting shares are, you know, the board of directors of Vanguard. So they have, um, you know, voting control over so much of the economy. So for Tesla, the majority shareholders of Tesla are the largest shareholder is Vanguard. Second largest shareholder is BlackRock. And then SGA funds management and uh, geo capital management coming in third and fourth. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe we maybe we should break up. I'm actually very aggressive on antitrust, so we probably agree here. Oh yeah, you know, this is totally a tangent. I actually saw a tweet from uh, Elizabeth Warren that I I agree with, which is probably a shocker. I don't know if uh, if I can find it here, but she tweeted. What are your thoughts on Elizabeth Warren? Um, I liked her in the, I liked her in the beginning, but man, she ran such a horrible campaign and the, the fake Native American thing is <laughs> really fucking stupid. All she had to do was, all, all she had to do was be like, look, I heard this story growing up about my, my Native American ancestors. Turns out maybe it was greatly exaggerated, greatly exaggerated. And parts <laughs> of it might not have been true. And I was wrong about that. Right, that's all she had to do. Right, <laughs> but instead <laughs> she's like doubling down on it. And... Uh, yeah, I, I think so that Trump was racist for for calling her that. Gosh, I'm I'm not a big fan of uh, I'm not a big fan of the Daily Wire. I, I'm not like there's some things I agree with Ben Shapiro on, but 
Um, but I'm not their biggest. I think they're kind of grifters as well. But uh, he knew he knew Elizabeth Warren back when he was uh, in law school. I guess he tells the story quite a bit, and I guess her I guess her opinions have changed uh, a lot since when she was a professor there. But um, she tweeted. I can't find the tweet, but she tweeted that she's trying to pass a bill that prevents members of Congress and I think the executive branch from um, owning or trading uh, individual stocks while they're in office, which I think that's really good. Yeah, I agree. That's, that's wild that they can do that now. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, like um, I'm not even, I'm not even sure it's a good thing for them to have mutual. I'd, I'd have to think about this more, but like, even having mutual funds gives you voting power in um, a lot of these companies. And so for like, for like a, for like a Senator, like uh, or for like a, a, you know, a, a junior representative in the United States house of representatives that doesn't have a lot of money, that's probably not a big deal. But like, if you're, if you're some billionaire Senator that, um, you know, can purchase, you know, a gazillion shares of some Vanguard mutual fund that actually gives you a lot of voting power in, um, you know, and sway in the decision-making of these companies. And I'm not a huge fan of that. Yeah. I mean, I, it's, it's so difficult too, because like you probably want, you want to attract people to be members of Congress. And like, you have to like, maybe have to have like some degree of investments for their retirement, unless you just want to guarantee them all a pension. Which I mean, we, we could do as well, but then people be like, "Oh, you get in there for two years, and now you got a pension for the rest of your life," you know. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I was, I, I think, um, I think probably the best option would be, uh, you like when you join, Cong- I'm trying to think of how this would work. When you join Congress, you put all of your, um funds into an escrow account and yeah it would suck because you don't have access to any liquidity while you're in but that might just be have a sacrifice you have to make to um you know serve in congress right yeah i mean probably something like like i don't know like escrow i or like a blind trust or something something where and also maybe not individual stocks at all like maybe they should be have to sell those i think they should probably have to sell like individual stocks Especially yeah. if they're if they're only like thirty percent of the company or something insane, right? They because they have a huge massive interest in that, so they should have to sell off individual stocks. And but they should I, I'm maybe fine with like an S and P five hundred or something like that, where it's just like you have a broad investment, not in any individual sector, but the overall economy as a whole. Like that right. might be okay. Yeah, I could I could see that. That but you also get so you know, and this is where Trump people are not gonna. Um, like me is you have, you know, someone like Donald Trump who owns, you know, essentially, you know, his, his hotel business is a private company, but he owns a hundred percent of the stock in that, uh, essentially. Right. And so, um, you know, what happens to someone who's a business owner that becomes a member of Congress because essentially their business is a stock, right? They're just a hundred percent of the shareholders. Yeah. I mean, they're going to have to, so, they're going to have to, divest themselves from it i guess it's just yeah i i don't know it's it's tough i mean but i i mean i i wholeheartedly agree with with elizabeth warren there i don't think members of congress should uh and and her her um her legislation that she's proposing is not just for members of congress but for their immediate family as well which i think is you know really important yeah unless unless then and unless then it ends up being like i mean you could then end up making it more difficult to catch people abusing it because you could have, you know, um, you know, a member of Congress then telling their, uh, you know, third cousin twice removed what stock trades to make as opposed to just telling their spouse, yeah. you know. And then, you know, we, <laughs> I mean, if we find out that's going on, then they should be prosecuted and go to prison for that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. But anyways, I think my wife just got home, so I think it, we've been going over an hour now. I think we got a lot, uh, a lot in. That was, it was pretty fun. You want to tell people where they can find you? Yeah. Uh, just techie on blue on YouTube. Also on kick Twitch and Facebook. 
Though I have to really look into the multi-streaming thing because it's not coming through great. It's like super laggy. But uh, thank oh, you for having me on, Andy. Thanks for the fun discussion. Where can people yeah, find thanks. you? Uh, yeah, Andy underscore P underscore 1989 on Twitter. And uh, same thing on YouTube. So appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yeah. All right. Well, have a good night. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks for watching. I'll probably have to like, I don't know if the YouTube video turned out okay, so I'll see. But I do have an audio recording as well. So, And it's also Perfect. on Andy's channel if you need to catch it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye.